Hello, 3ABN family. I'm Jill Morricone. We just welcome you to another 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're in my favorite gospel, the Gospel of John, lesson number six, more testimonies about Jesus. We studied last week. If you missed it, it was a powerful study. Check it out on YouTube or 3ABN Plus, which is our free app that you can download and share with people. But last week, we studied about Jesus' witness to the woman at the well. And and by extension, the entire village there, the Samaritans, who found Jesus as their Messiah. I want to introduce to you my family, your family on the panel. To my left, my sister in Jesus, Shelley Quinn. I'm glad to be your sister. I have Monday's lesson, A New Understanding of the Messiah. Amen. In the middle, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Jill and Shelley. I have Tuesday's lesson, Acceptance and Rejection. Mm. Next, Pastor James, Professor Daniel Perrin. Yes, I'm excited about Wednesday's lesson, which is called The Witness of the Father. Amen. Last but not least, Pastor John Denzi. Thank you. I have Thursday. It's a blessing to be here. And the title is The Witness of the Crowd. Mm. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor James, would you pray for me? Yes, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for your word and for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit to guide our hearts and minds and to guide the hearts and minds of each one of our viewers. We ask for that gift to be poured out upon us now as we study together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In John's gospel, we discover that Jesus proclaims who he is. Sometimes he says fairly astonishing things to the people of that time about himself who he is, who sent him, where he came from. In fact, if you read John chapter 7, verse 15, it says the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? They were amazed at what he taught and the way he taught. The Pharisees sent officers to arrest Jesus, and the officers failed in their mission. And then the Pharisees said, wait a minute, why didn't you arrest Jesus? And what did they say in John 7, 46? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. But we discover in the Gospel of John that Jesus doesn't also speak a certain way. In addition, he lives it. The signs, the miracles that were performed through his earthly ministry testified to who he was. We see in John 7, 31, when the Christ comes, he would do more signs. Will he do more signs than which this man has already done? So Jesus talked the talk, but he also walked the walk as it were. Our memory text is John 12, verse 32. Jesus speaking, I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men, all peoples to myself. And yet the drawing power is there. The love is there. The substitutionary atonement is there. The free gift of eternal life is freely offered. The great exchange is there, as Shelley always says. But yet you and I have a choice. We each can receive or reject. How do we respond to that? Last week when we studied the woman at the well, she responded positively, did she not? And all the Samaritans came and chose to accept Jesus. Amen. We're going to study this week with after the feeding of the 5,000, some of the multitude didn't respond so favorably and how some of them chose to reject Jesus. The resurrection of Lazarus, we studied a few weeks ago. And after that, some of the people had greater faith in Jesus, and they turned toward him after that witness. And some people chose to turn away. Mm -hmm. This week, we look at the testimonies of who Jesus is. We start with John the Baptist. Shelley and I talk about that. Then we're going to the response of the people after feeding the 5,000, the witness of the Father and the witness of the crowd. On Sunday, it has a very long title, but I'll read it for you. Humility of Soul. John the Baptist testifies again. Mm. What we're really looking at is the witness of John the Baptist and his humility in that witness. For this study, we're going over to John chapter 3. So turn with me to John chapter 3. These are the final recorded words of John the Baptist in the, the Gospel of John. And just leading up to it, I'm going to give you a five-fold response from John the Baptist. And I believe 
it's the response that we should have as Christians today. Amen. The response he had, this five-fold response, should be the same response that we exhibit today. But leading up to it, let's figure out what causes jealousy or animosity going on. We're in verse 22, John 3, 22. Jesus and the disciples came to the land of Judea, and he remained with them and baptized. Now, you might think, wait a minute, was Jesus baptizing? You just have to go over to John chapter 4 to discover it says very clearly Jesus was not baptizing, but his disciples baptized. Verse 23, John was also baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So this is several months have passed since John baptized Jesus in the Jordan. And John is still continuing his baptism ministry, this call, this baptism of repentance. And Jesus' disciples are baptizing as well. Verse 25, there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. This had to do with those washing rituals. And then John's disciples brought the dispute to John, but yet it turned into jealousy against Jesus. See this in verse 26. John's disciples come to John and they said, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Mm -hmm. Now, we expect this in the secular world, do we not? Who we want to climb the corporate ladder faster. Does that take place in the secular world? We want to have a nicer car, a better job, a prettier wife. Does that take place in the secular world? But can that happen in the church? Can jealousy and the spirit of pride and supremacy arise even amongst God's people? Have you ever heard that? So-and-so has more people at his prayer meeting. So-and-so has more views on YouTube than this preacher. More people like this singer or this Bible teacher. Have you experienced that? Have you seen jealousy and pride and love of supremacy arise even in the work of God? Well, it happened in Jesus' day. This is what's going on right now. And the disciples of John are upset because Jesus is getting more popularity. Let's look at John's response. This is his five-fold response that I believe should be our response as well. Number one, anything I have is from God. His first response, anything I have is from God. You see that in John 3, 28. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. In other words, it wasn't John's in the first place. It's not his to earn. It's not his to keep. It was given by God above. God gave John his mission. God gave also Jesus his mission. They were simply working out what God had called them to do. Anything you and I have is from God. Number two, that's not my role. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. That's not my role. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. But I have been sent before him. John clearly understood what his role was. In John 1, 29, he had called out Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Number three, I will experience joy in others' success. Mm -hmm. This is in verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Now, this is an illustration. Who is the bridegroom? None other than the Lord Jesus himself. And who is the bride? That is his people. That is the church. So this marriage, as it were, is taking place. Jesus came for his people. Who's the friend of the bridegroom? We would call it in today's vernacular, it's the best man. Mm. So John the Baptist was, as it were, the best man, mm. helping to facilitate the wedding. But his joy is in the wedding because the bridegroom, that's Jesus, is marrying the bride. He knows his role isn't to go on the honeymoon. His role isn't to live with the bride and the bridegroom together forever. No, he's facilitating it, and then they take it mm. from there. 
he experiences joy in others' successes. Now let's go down to John 3, verse 30. I will push for others to be seen, recognized, and rewarded. What does he say in John 3, 30? He must increase, meaning Jesus must increase. But I, I must decrease. I will be happy where God has placed me, doing what God has given me to do. You see, when the role of the best man was done, the best man was going to fade away because that's the point of the best man. And the bridegroom and bride spend eternity together. The best man never leaves with a bride. That's not the point. There would be a problem if that were to mm -hmm. take place. This is true humility. He must increase, but I, I must decrease. I don't need anybody to know I worked on that project. I don't need anybody to applaud how hard I'm working. I don't need anybody to recognize how many Bible studies I give, how many sermons I preached, how many people I've baptized, how many people I've led to Christ. Let's talk about other people. Let's lift up Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus and lift him up and who he is. And number five, I recognize my place and position. You see this in verse 31. John recognizes who Jesus is and what his position is. And by contrast, he recognizes who he is and what his position is. He says, I'm not in the same category as Jesus. He knows that. John 3, 31, he who comes from above is above all. That would be Jesus. Jesus came from above and he is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. This comparison between John and Jesus. What are you and I supposed to do? When the sin of pride creeps in. What are you and I supposed to do when jealousy enters our heart and enters the work of God? Number one, we just go to God and we say, thank you for showing me my heart. Thank you for showing me that there is sin in my life and I want you to take that out. Point your eyes, look at Jesus, not yourself and clearly not other people. Look at Jesus, recognize that everything we have is from God. Know our role and what he's called us to do, not other people, mm -hmm. but us. Experience joy in other people's successes. Strive to lift up Jesus and push other people forward, not yourself, and recognize what our own place and our own position is as sons and daughters of God. Oh, amen. Thank you, Jill. I always love your lists. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Monday, a new understanding of the Messiah. I'm going to deviate from my notes a bit here, but we see in John, uh, especially John 1, 32 through 36, God told John in advance how he would know who the Messiah, the true Son of God, the deity was. And he told him, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so John says, yeah, I saw it happen. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Then the next day he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Now here's the interesting thing, and I want to kind of touch back to the, the verses you just talked about. See, we've discussed this several times. Mm -hmm. The religious majority had it wrong at the time of Jesus' arrival. They thought the Messiah was going to be a deliverer, a conquering king to free them. John is the last Old Covenant prophet, and he understands Isaiah 53. He knows the suffering Messiah. He understands he will be the Lamb of God that reflects the perfect character of God and this perfection that it, it would point to him being our substitutionary sacrifice. Remember the Passover lamb. Well, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Jesus is 
our Passover lamb who was sacrificed for us. Now, John made these statements in what you just looked at. I see in John chapter 3, verses 31 through 35, five reasons for Jesus' supremacy. John says, hey, he came from above. So that's verse 31 of John chapter 3. So Jesus had a heavenly or a origin. Number two, he says, uh, he testifies, and then, let's see, what he has seen and heard that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. Jesus is speaking from firsthand experience. This is the creator of the world. Number three, he says he has received the testimony, has certified that God is true. So he's agreeing with God. Then he says he is the one who speaks the words of God, and he doesn't have the Holy Spirit without measure. Then he says, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. All right. John is bringing, John the Baptist is bringing a new understanding of who the Messiah is. We need to review our own understanding. And I want to lead you to John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. This jumped out at me a number of years ago and change the way I studied the Messiah. John says, Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 46, he's talking to the Jews. And he says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Wow, how much do time do we spend in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? If we believe Moses, we will understand the Messiah. Why? Because in the writings of Moses, covenant language, covenant titles, covenant terms that are applied to Jesus, the person of Jesus Christ, are first introduced and explained, and it opens our eyes to a new understanding of the Messiah. For example, firstborn. This is talking about when we know that in Exodus 4, 22 through 23, God sends Moses to Pharaoh, and what does he do? He says, you go tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So we've got two words here that are covenant language. Firstborn, Israel wasn't the first nation, but firstborn means preeminence. So when the Bible is speaking of Christ as being firstborn of all creation, it has nothing to do with order of birth. If you understand Moses' writings in the covenant language, you know it is he is preeminent over all because he created all. And then the idea of only begotten. This is something that we see that uh, uh, God tells Abraham, take your only son, Isaac. This is your only begotten. He talks about he was the father in Deuteronomy. He is the father who begot Israel. So begotten means chosen for a covenant purpose. We see the idea of the only, the only begotten is the unique. It's a person like Isaac was called the only begotten son of God. That's because he was uniquely chosen to produce seed for the covenant, and he was the heir of all the covenant blessings of God. Isaac was second born to Abraham. He wasn't first born, but he's considered the first born in covenant language. Now, son of God, this is covenant language. God called Israel his son. The first Adam was called son of God. We see that in Luke 3.38. And the second Adam mm -hmm. is also called son of God. Son of God is a title that is given to people, human beings, who are walking in 
covenant relationship with God. And when we think of Israel, that's a covenant term. Even we see that uh, in Genesis, Israel, Jacob was renamed a covenant name, Israel, after he uh, wrestled with God. But the point is this, because I don't want to miss this. Son of God is a covenant title that proves the deity of Jesus. Mm. He is the unique, one-of-a-kind son of the covenant who is the covenant in the flesh. In Isaiah 42, verses 6 through 7, the Lord says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will give you as a covenant. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He says, I'm going to give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, bring out prisoners from the prison, and those who sit in darkness mm. from the prison. Luke one thirty five. I love this. The angel told Mary, the angel who is announcing the birth, that she's going to give birth to the Messiah. That Holy One, mm -hmm. Luke one thirty five, who is to be born to you will be called the Son mm -hmm. of God. He is the covenant Son. He had to become a person to be the covenant mm -hmm. Son of God. In a limited sense, we're sons of God. Romans 8, 14 says, as many as led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. But the full authority of that covenant title, Son of God, uniquely belongs to Jesus. It obviously reflects his deity because the Pharisees rebuked him for blasphemy when he called himself the Son of God, making himself equal with God. But listen to this. Hebrews 1.5 says, I love this. Hebrews 1 is very powerful. Mm -hmm. For to which of the angels did God the Father, he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. He's talking about Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus. And he's saying, hey, this is what God said to Jesus. You are my son. The day I've begotten you, I'll be your father. But then look at verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 1. But to the son, he says, mm. your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Jesus was the second person of the Godhead, came down to take on flesh and become the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. Let us have this understanding of the Messiah, that he was born to die, to satisfy God's justice against sin. Amen. Thank you so much, Shelley. We're just getting started. We want to take a moment and share with you a mission moment, and we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Greg Morconi. I'm so glad you joined me for today's 3ABN Mission Moment. Last week, we learned about Travis, who was bullied as a kid and developed anxiety. And then when he became an adult and it seemed that life was improving, his marriage crumbled and his world collapsed. Hurt and grieving, he remembered how Jesus suffered in Gethsemane, but was willing to endure anything to save us from our sins. This filled him with hope, and although he'd given up on college because of his learning disabilities, he went back to earn his degree in computer programming. His learning disability held him back until he discovered he could learn by watching YouTube videos on physics and calculus for up to eight hours a day. However, YouTube would play an even bigger role in his spiritual journey soon. When he felt lonely, isolated, and tired, God would remind him of the promise in John 14, 27, where Jesus said, My peace I give to you. And another from Matthew 19, 26 that says, With God, all things are possible. Yes, God had big plans for Travis. He not only finished his college degree, he landed a job with an aerospace company. Yet something was still missing from Travis's life. 
Join us next week to discover how God used 3ABN and YouTube in His life. And that's today's 3ABN Mission Moment. Welcome back to lesson number six, more testimonies about Jesus. We're going to pass it over to Pastor James. I have Tuesday's lesson, and it's entitled Acceptance and Rejection. We're focusing primarily on John chapter 6. The quarterly says lesson 2 described the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, but did not cover the final section of that story, which we're going to study right now. So we're going to be looking at John chapter 6, verses 51 to 71. A lot of reading here. We're going to not read all the verses, but we'll read a lot of them. And just asking the questions we go into these verses, what did Jesus say that the people had trouble accepting? What was Jesus saying here that the people had trouble accepting? And I just want to add a little bit to that. And do we have the same problem today with accepting what Jesus is saying right here? Jesus begins, we'll start in verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, this is what the Jews had a problem with. In fact, in verse 52, the Jews thereof strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? Again, as Shelley was sharing and Jill also, they took it literally. They didn't understand the spiritual lesson here. And when we talk about biblical truth, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so Jesus tries to open them up a little bit. Verse 53, then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye shall eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh, verse 54, and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is meat or food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. Jesus is trying to share with them the spiritual truth here. It's about abiding in Jesus Christ. It's about eating him as the bread of life. It's not literal eating his flesh and drinking his blood. We're not cannibals here. We're not talking about cannibalism. It's talking about partaking of the life of Jesus Christ, his blood, his death, his perfect obedience for us in the gospel, the everlasting covenant that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say this, as the living father has sent me and I live by the father, so he that eats me shall live by me. You see that abiding relationship again talked about here and really expounded upon in John chapter 15. And then he hits it right on the head. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. All right, so we're talking here about the Word of God. We're talking about the Bible, the truths of the Bible, the bread of life. That's why John opens the gospel. If you remember, the gospel of John opens up with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And of course, this is talking about Jesus Christ, who became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is kind of doing a reverse on that right now, right? He's starting with me. I'm Jesus, the flesh and blood. Or I'm, this is me right here. You need to partake of me, meaning you need to partake of the Word. And of course, John was clear on this, and he's just revisiting the same truth back here in John chapter 6 that he already shared with us in John chapter 1. The power is in the the word of God. That's right. And we need to partake of that word. And of course, Satan knows this. He tries to obscure the word of God. He tries to hide it. He tries to misquote it. Uh, he tries to get us to focus on things that aren't even significant in relationship to the word of God. And so Jesus is trying to direct us back again to these truths of the word of God. Now, many of his disciples, verse 6, when they had heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? They tried to make it sound like Jesus was talking about cannibalism. That's what they tried to make it sound like. But he wasn't talking about cannibalism at all. He was talking about abiding in him. He was talking about making the word of God first and foremost in your life. Now, the people that are listening to him are his disciples, not just his 12 disciples, but his larger group of 70 disciples. And Jesus is making a point. You know, you've cast out devils. You've done many wonderful works. I've sent you from place to place. And, you know, you've been part of the ministry here. We got a lot of people involved in ministry, but, but there's something missing in your experience. You've got to settle into the fact that you need to 
to abide in me, to partake of me, if you actually want this to be real. All these outward things are good, but if you want a real experience with me, you're gonna have to go deeper. And in a sense, Jesus is bringing a test to his followers, to his disciples, to his, we could say his 82 disciples, the 70 plus the 12. And Jesus is going to bring a similar test to God's church in these last days. Now, the test that Jesus was bringing to his disciples at this point was the test of partaking of the word of God, partaking of the, the, the literal blood and flesh of Jesus. No, but partaking of the bread of life, the, the word of God that sustains our spiritual life. And it's kind of interesting to me what takes place in verse 66 of John 6. John 6, 6, 6. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. John 6, 6, 6 actually gives us a little bit of a, a key that unlocks the mystery of Revelation 13 and 6, 6, 6. Because the key in these verses is the same key that we're going to be experiencing in Revelation chapter 13. You're going to have followers of Christ who are going to be tested as to whether they really follow the Word of God and partake of that Word or whether they're actually following man. And we're seeing this right now in relationship to Christ. Christ realizes that these 70 disciples are really following men. That is men's understanding of Messiah, how Messiah was going to come, what he was going to do when he came, how he was going to set his kingdom up and set them free from the Romans. And Jesus is trying to completely dismiss that and get them on track. You need to partake of my word so that you can really understand what my kingdom is all about. The seven disciples don't buy it. They don't accept it. They turn away from it. John 6, 6, 6. Will God's people in the end of time do the same thing? The test for believers today is the same as the test was for Christ's followers in his day. It is Jesus, the Word. In fact, when you look in Revelation chapter 14, which is kind of a, a post-Revelation uh, 13 uh, counsel or directive for God's followers, it says in Revelation 14 verse 4 that God's people in the context, context of, the, of the test of the mark of the beast are going to follow the lamb wherever he goes. Now let's just put that in John chapter 1 verse 1 language. They're going to follow the word of God wherever it leads them. Whatever the Word of God says, that's what they're going to do. That was my testimony when I became a Christian. I wasn't an Adventist. In fact, I was trying to get my sister out of the church, out of the Adventist church. I was, yeah, I wasn't sure about these Adventists and all these strange doctrines. But as I started studying the Word of God with Adventists, I began to realize these people follow the Bible. Mm -hmm. My friends from Calvary Chapel and from the Pentecostal church were worried about me. I was going to become an Adventist. And I told them, don't worry, I'm not going to become an Adventist. I'm just going to follow the Word of God. Wherever the Word leads me, that's where I'm going to go. And this is the same test for God's people in the end of time. Wherever the Word of God leads us, is that where we're going to go? In fact, in Daniel chapter 12, which is a parallel to Revelation chapters 13 and 14, we have the same thing taking place when Michael stands up and probation closes and a time of trouble such as never was comes upon the world, which is synonymous with the seven last plagues in Revelation 15 and 16. We have a people who are going to be delivered and they're described as a people who are written in the book. They're written in the book. The question we want to ask ourselves is, how did they get their names written in this book so that they're delivered in the time of trouble? How did they get their names written in this book? Malachi chapter 3, and I want you to look here in verses 15 to 18, tells us, Now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. In fact, we have a whole month for them. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then it says in verse 16, they that feared the Lord spake often one to another and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In that day, verse 17, when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. This is a direct connection to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. That's what's taking place in John chapter 6. Christ's disciples, through this test of being directed to partake of the word of God, and follow the Lamb wherever He goes, 
are discerning now between the righteous and the wicked, between him that really serves God and him that serves him not. The separation is taking place. It took place in John chapter 6 among Christ's own disciples, and it will take place in Revelation 13 among those professed believers in these last days. The difference is going to be those who are partaking of the word of God and following that word wherever it leads them, i.e. following Jesus Christ wherever he leads the way. And that is the call that God has for each one of us in John chapter 6 today. Make sure you partake of the flesh and blood of Jesus, i.e. the bread of life, the word of God, and follow it wherever it leads you. Amen. What a blessing. Follow the lamb, follow the word. Amen. That was great. I'm Daniel Perrin, and I have Wednesday's le lesson, which is the witness of the Father. And you can go to John 8 in your Bible, because that's where we're going to be in just a few moments here. But as Jill referenced earlier, Jesus made a lot of claims of his identity and his authority. We're not going to revisit all of them right here, but how would we know, how could you know if Jesus or anybody who made claims like he made, how that they're telling the truth? Well, we need evidence, we need testimony, and we need witnesses. The question is, whose testimony do you want to hear? In other words, who do you trust? Or who is trustworthy? You know, trust your own evidence, your own witness? How about your parents or a bystander? Sometimes we like to go to the opponents. Let's see what the opponents have to say. Or a news report, or if I read it online, or if it was in a published book, or a peer-reviewed journal. We, we can find all sorts of evidence and witnesses, and they very well might be telling the truth. But when it comes to spiritual things, especially like the testimonies of Christ, we want to know from somebody who has a reputation for knowing it all. He's got all the information already. So for me personally, there are certain people whose opinions matter more to me than others. I know that's probably true to you as well. In spiritual things, well, in all things, I trust the Father's witness. Mm -hmm. When it comes down to, to, to whether or not I'm pleasing or I want to know whether or not I pleased the Father, the Ancient of Days, who nothing escapes him, having been there from time, eternity past, a thorough acquaintance with all things present, past, and future. Nobody is more trustworthy than the Father. Even Jesus' enemies agreed with that, right? We trust the Word of God, they said. No mere man's testimony uh, do they want to take, and no mere man's testimony can prove Jesus. And that's why the Jewish leader said to him in chapter 8, verse 13, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. They were treating his testimony as that of a mere man. Now, Jesus agreed with them that no mere man's testimony was sufficient, but he disagreed with them, with the Jewish leaders who claimed that his witness was the witness of a mere man, because he wasn't. Verse 14, then Jesus says, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from and where I'm going. In other words, the truth is the truth, regardless of what unbelief you throw at it. Jesus simply comes and he is, he declares, he illustrates, he demonstrates, he is the truth. And he then turned their attention to the Father's testimony in several places, right here in this chapter, verse 17 and 18. It is also written, Jesus said, in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Look at the word of God. Two witnesses agreeing together on truth. All right, we can trust that. And then verse 54 of chapter 8, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God. Mm -hmm. You say you're trusting in the Father. The Father has testified. And the lesson points us, the first text that is given in the lesson to chapter 5, verse 37. And Jesus says, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You say you believe in the Father. The Father has testified. And then Jesus goes on, You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. 
In other words, the Father confirms the Son, but we don't understand the Father if we don't accept the Son. They're working in unison. They're they're not separate. They're working together. And so the question is, will we accept the Father's testimony? In fact, will we even recognize it? Or will we, like the Jewish leaders, exalt our opinions above so we can't even hear the voice of God because we won't accept the voice of Jesus? If we, if we accept one, we, accept them, we must accept them both. If we reject one, we have to reject them both. Mm-hmm. And so behind every struggle of belief and faith really is a struggle to trust the Father. And that's the whole great controversy story. That's right. Can we trust the Father? Should we trust the Father? And Jesus comes down to say, let me give you evidence that you can trust the Father, and the Father gives evidence that we can trust the Son. So what is the Father's witness? The lesson highlights a couple of stories that are not included in John's gospel, but John's readers were familiar with them, and so are we. And the first one is in Matthew 3. We find it in Mark and Luke as well, but that's Jesus' baptism where, as as Matthew describes, Matthew 3.17, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. Jesus is pouring out his prayer to heaven and Desire of Ages, page 111, says that, that Jesus asks for the witness that God accepts humanity in the person of his son. It says that even angels were listening to a prayer unlike any they'd ever heard, and they wanted to bring a confirmation to Jesus. But the Father himself will answer the petition of his Son, places his seal upon him. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He's untainted by sin. And this is then a witness to us, if we are willing to trust the Father, that we can cling to Jesus and be accepted in and through him. Matthew 17 then, near the end of Jesus' ministry, disciples are struggling to understand and believe Jesus' testimony about himself and what he's about to go through down in Jerusalem. And so Jesus is transfigured before them with the radiance and brightness of his heavenly glory. Peter, James, and John see it. And together, the three of those disciples, along with Jesus, they again hear the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Listen to him. Listen to his testimony. And then finally, John tells us this one in chapter 12, verse 17. There's testimonies that are coming in about Jesus, but still we need to hear the testimony of the Father. So in in chapter 12, verses 20 to 33, I'll just focus in on 27 here. Jesus says, my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then, here it is again, a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. But not everybody heard the voice, not everybody understood it. Some thought it was thunder, others thought maybe it was an angel, but the Father has testified once again. Why was there no voice of witness from the Father at the cross? Wouldn't that be the prime time to tell the world, this is my beloved son, listen to him, watch him, behold the lamb? That certainly would have been our policy. That's that's what I would have thought. That's what I would have done. But the Father in this moment on the cross of Calvary is apparently silent. Mm -hmm. Now, we know he wasn't absent, wasn't completely silent. Matthew's testimony tells us that there was a great earthquake. There was an unnatural darkness. There was the rending of the temple veil that we find in Matthew 27. And all of those things, evidence of the involvement and the presence of the Father. But why don't we hear a voice at the cross? A couple of reasons. And the first is that Jesus himself must trust the witness and testimony of the Father. He goes through and illustrates for us what our experience must be. When he's surrounded by darkness and feels abandoned, he trusts those very same words he's heard. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he gives illustration of the experience we must go through. And second is that the cross must speak for itself. Words can declare, but actions will demonstrate. And the cross demonstrates, illustrates, and it shows the glory of God. It is his glory and his character, and it is his love. And the Father testifies through the Son. 
Romans 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 8, 32, he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. The Father's glory is revealed in the Son. And just like Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. When you see the cross, you see the love of the Father. But there's more. I don't want to miss this. Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, John is wondering, is there anyone who can open the scroll? And then he sees, he hears the lion of the tribe of Judah. He sees a lamb as if it's been slain in verse 7, then he came, that lion, that lamb, and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This is the testimony of the Father, that his sacrifice was accepted and that the plan of salvation was going forth exactly as it had been planned from eternity eternity past. The Father testifies of the Son. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a a time uh, this Cyber School lesson is uh, amen, amen, amen. <laughs> well, we are now on Thursday's portion of the lesson, and the title is The Witness of the Crowd. My name is John Dinsey, and I invite you to join me in this part of the study. And it brings you to the lesson with this question. When Jesus spoke to the Jews attending the Feast of Tabernacles, what was the response of many in the crowd? We're talking about the crowd and the witness of the crowd. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 53. We read first 37 and 38. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Powerful message from Jesus. The crowd heard this. Now, it's interesting that in this last day of the feast, something something happened uh, during this time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And I'm reading to you from uh, actually the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Bible Commentary. And concerning this part, it says that This this saying of Jesus undoubtedly has reference to the water libation ceremony. This is like an offering of a drink offering uh, conducted during the seven days of the feast. The Mishnah describes the ceremony thus. A golden flagon holding three logs was filled from the Siloam, the the, uh, river of Siloam, the spring of Siloam. When they arrived at the water gate, they sounded a tekia, it's a long blast. A terua, a, tremult, a tremel, tremulous note, and again a tekia, a long blast. Mm-hmm. The priest then went up to the ascent of the altar and turned to his left, where there were two silver bowls. The one on the west was for water, and the one on the east for wine. Uh, and this is uh, from the Talmud on page uh, 226. And so this was taking place, and Jesus makes this declaration. I'll read it, read it again for you, John 7, 37 and 38. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. What was Jesus talking about? The answer is found in the next verse, John 7, 39. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, Mm -hmm. whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus made this declaration and notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 44, verses 2 and 3. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Fear not. O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. This is a a very uh, good link to what Jesus was saying. Now let us turn our attention to Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust 
and not be afraid. For Yahweh, the Lord is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Yeah. And I encourage you to draw water from the well of salvation, Jesus Christ. Let's go back to John chapter 7 and verse 40. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, truly, this is the prophet. So I ask you a question, what, what prophet were they talking about? Let's turn our attention to Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, beginning in verse 15. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. This is Moses talking about Jesus. According to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it, require it of him. So we see here that they're asking, is this that prophet, the prophet that Moses talked about? John chapter 7, verse 41. What else are the crowd saying? Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Some of them wanted to take him means they wanted to take him and kill him. Uh, I want to uh, guide you to John chapter 7. Notice what is going on here in John chapter 7. Uh, Jesus in verse 14 says, Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. This is what was going on at that time. And the Jews marvel, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Mm -hmm. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it be, whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. So there was a division concerning Jesus. In John chapter 7, verse 45, notice what happens. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. So people were hearing Jesus and people were being impacted by Jesus. They knew this was not just a regular guy. Jesus was bringing words of life and people were wondering about him. Oh, he's the prophet. Oh, he's, could this be the Christ? And so there was a great, great uh, talking among the people and the scribes and Pharisees were getting nervous. John chapter 7, verse 50 now says, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. <laughs> so at the right time, Nicodemus was there. And I can tell you that God has his people everywhere. <laughs> and at the right time, they speak under the influence of the Holy Spirit to influence committees, to influence nations and governments, telling them the right thing to do. And it's a voice in the crowd speaking God's words to the people so that the right decision will be made for the benefit of God's people. I read to you from the lesson. It says, even the arresting officers were stymied by him and of the eloquence of his words, the Pharisees responded to the officers with another question. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? John 7, 48. This question from the Pharisees gave John the opportunity again to bring in Nicodemus. 
who, after having had his meeting with Jesus, was seeking to protect Jesus from their machinations. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? The lesson also brings this question. Did Nicodemus ever accept Jesus as the Messiah? Though this scene does not prove that he had, between this act and what he did after Jesus died, you can see John 19, 39 and 40, the Bible gives us solid evidence that Nicodemus did, in fact, come to believe in Jesus. And so the answer to their question was, yes, in fact, one of the Pharisees did believe in him after all. He did not want, Nicodemus did not want to openly manifest himself yet, but the time came when he did. And seeds were being planted even among the priests and scribes and Pharisees. Notice what we have in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient That's right. to the faith. So seeds were being planted and decisions were made for Jesus. Then and eventually, God bless His holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny and Daniel and Pastor James and Shelley. What an incredible study as we've looked at more testimonies about Jesus. I want to give each one of you a moment to share a final thought. I just would like to read a comment that came from Monday's lesson. And it says, knowledge that Jesus is the Christ comes from God himself through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. This theme appears frequently in John. Salvation does not come from worldly philosophy, science, or higher learning. It comes only from God to a heart surrendered in faith and obedience to Jesus. Amen. Another th closing thought here from John chapter 6 and verse 63. Jesus clarifying what he meant when he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Mm. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Regarding the witness of the Father, Desire of Ages, page 790, gives us this incredible promise. Jesus refused to receive the homage of his people until he had the assurance that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father. He ascended to the heavenly courts and from God himself heard the assurance that his atonement for the sins of men had been ample and that through his blood all might gain eternal life. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, we had the crowd saying, is this the prophet, is this the Christ? In the crowd, people were hearing these things. And today, we need witnesses in the crowds, whether it be in your school, whether it be in your neighborhood, whether it be in your job, we need witnesses for Jesus so that you can plant seeds for Jesus Christ and they will bring fruit unto glory of God. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the call that was made in the Gospel of John. That's the call that extends down through the ages to you and to I, to make a decision and accept the gift of Christ's blood on the cross, as it were, his substitutionary death in my place, so that you and I can have the gift of eternal life. So just reach out and accept him by faith today. Join us next week, lesson number seven. Blessed are those who believe. We're going to be looking more at those who testify of the identity of Jesus. Join us then. Know that we love you and pray for you.